good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Shenzhen. We're all happy that you're here. I get the privilege of introducing Dr. Martin, who is a very recent addition to the civics family, where I spend a short and terse first portion of my existence in this <laughs> university. Um, so we are happy to have him here at Andrews. He has survived his first winter, um, which is very significant since um, in his previous lifetime, he has been in Brazil and South Africa. He got his original BS and MS in mechanical engineering, and I'm gonna try and pronounce this correct, at Universidade yes. Federal do Paraná, so a little yeah. bit of Portuguese. And then after that, he worked in Florida for some time at the Advanced Power Systems at Florida State University, and he got his PhD in 2012. So um, from there, he went to South Africa to um, have a postdoctoral fellowship at University of Pretoria, and he became a senior lecturer there, and then we decided to recruit him and bring him over to the wonderful weather of Michigan. <laughs> so we are happy to have him here, um, and he's going to be talking to us about suicide. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Martin, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for the invite to talk to you about uh, about fuel cells. And yes, I survived my first mild winter, as people like to say. <laughs> and it was so mild that when the summer came, people already now feeling the summer. They say that's not summer yet. I say no, it's getting warmer. It's gonna get hot. It's gonna reach 98, 100 degrees, 95. I say that's not true. <laughs> you guys are trying to prank me. Oh well, we did have a few days that actually we reached there. And I feel depressed that the summer's already gone, right? My, f my friends in, in Florida and in South Africa, they're still enjoying 100 degrees at 10 a.m. And I <laughs> must say that I miss that very much. But I'm getting there. Hopefully, uh, the next winter is going to be mild again. Okay, so let's talk about the fuel cells then. So, so yeah, so that's what I do, right? So I, I work with energy systems, right? So I've been working with um, thermodynamics since I was in my sophomore year in, in college, right? So um, I was a mechanical engineering student and my thermodynamics professor, my first thermodynamics professor, once was saying, so well, you're mechanical engineer students and, you know, robotics, computers, everything is being, you know, uh, programmed. So people are saying that there's no future for this kind of engineer anymore. Because in the future, the computers are designed things, the computers are designed machines, and they don't need this kind of profession anymore. But he says something that make me a believer that I would have a job forever. He said, listen, Electricity generates heat, right? And the computers, you always need electricity, you always use energy. And if you don't know how to dissipate that, so the computers will fail. So yes, they need professionals like you. So well, that's great, because as long as, that's what I used to say, as long as humanity needs energy, I'll have a job, right? So <laughs> that's what fuel cells do. So they generate electricity, right? Okay, so I work with mathematical modeling and the purpose of mathematical modeling is one of the purposes of mathematical modeling is have optimization too, right? Every time I define what a mathema mathematical modeling is, I always say, well, you might apply this concept in two different ways, right? Let's say that you have a phenomena that you don't know. You just know that that happens, but you don't know how, then, then why. You want to study that phenomena for the first time, let's say like this, right? So then you run some experiments. Right, and then you have a pattern of, of the experiment itself, how the phenomena happens, and then you come up with physical laws using mathematical tools, and then you say, now this phenomena is modeled by this set of equations. Right? This is one um, definition of mathematical modeling or modeling. The other one, which is the one that I'm more experienced doing, it, is we have the first principles, and you have a, f a phenomena, and you model this phenomena according to the mathematical. Um, equations, right? And if you want to change something, we change in your model. We don't need to build the system again, right? 
So if you wanna now, if you have your car running with gasoline and you wanna see how it, how it works if you change your engine to diesel, you don't have to make a diesel engine and put it in there. You can use a mathematical model and make the changes in there and now you see what the behavior is, right? So that leads us to another issue then. So now we are using computers to make our calculations that great. So we were gonna store all those data, right? So in these big places where, as we all know, generates heat. So you need somehow to manage that, right? But anyways, all those um, scientific challenges for the next generation. So fuel cells then. So we're gonna talk about the motivation, the objectives. I work with two different fuel cells, alkaline fuel cells and polymeric one. We did some uh, validation, experimental validation and work of optimization. So let's, um, let's talk about this then. Okay, so fuel cells then. So why you're going to fuel cells? So they have high efficiency, right? Energy conversion 60%, 80% if you have cogeneration because we use fuel cells to generate electricity, but they also generate heat, right? So why not use the heat? And if you do that, we can reach 80%, right? Low emissions, it's safe and clean, reliable energy, alternative energy, so, uh, uh, energy sources compared to fossil fuel. Why you have fuel flexibility, you can use hydrogen for lower temperature fuel cells, which is the one we're gonna talk about today. But you can use other, um, Methane, for example, you can break it down in hydrogen and then you can run the fuel cell too. And yes, we care about the environment, right? So as we we're saying, we can have hydrogen from natural gas and not as liquids, biological process, wind turbines. We can generate electricity so you can break water into hydrogen and oxygen and then use that in fuel cells, right? and biomass as well. So here's the thing though, so fuel cell is something that um, people are very excited about. The part of energy has a specific department to handle that, but it's not about fuel cell itself, right? The fuel for fuel cells is hydrogen, right? So let's say we are almost there, right? Let's say that now we have cars running with fuel cells. We need hydrogen as a fuel, right? So now we need to have at every corner a gas station with hydrogen. So I need to produce that amount of hydrogen. So I need to transport that amount of hydrogen. I need to store that amount of hydrogen, right? So there is also, once again, uh, scientific challenges, not only the fuel cell, the device, it, uh, the only the device itself, right? Uh, there is, um, we can use fuel cells in houses, right? So then during the day, you can generate hydrogen and oxygen using the electricity that you get from sun or as we're saying here as wind turbines right because in the day nobody's at home right so you can break down the molecule of water but at this time right everybody's there watching tv you know cooking and everything so you need energy and you don't have the sun right okay so once again no fossil fuel involved so free from incomplete reactions right yes you can say incomplete but you can have, depending on the design of fuel cell, I have problem of fuel not reacting, which is also a problem, right? And here, what I call less reversibility compared to heat engines. So why is that a, a plus, right? Because think about it, right? Heat engines, we need, we have a chemical reaction, so then you have heat, and then the heat transforms energy into motion, right? So we have loss of energy in between, and we don't have this in here. Right, so we don't need to generate heat. We don't need to generate heat, then generate motion, right? You can get that from the electricity. And, and here, no moving parts, so it's quiet, right? Okay, so as I was saying, the Department of Energy has a, a department that cares or handles the fuel cells, right? So then the Department of Energy cares about all those things, right? Hydrogen is one of them, so the fuel cells. They have a plan, I'm gonna talk about the plan just now, right? And you have the series of applications. Stationary power, power which means that we can run, uh, you can use fuel cells to generate electricity here on campus. That's a lot of research that I'm doing. I have a student that is making this study. It's a feasibility study. Can you now use fuel cells to generate the electricity on campus, 
or we don't need only electricity, we need heat as well. So you can use fuel cells for that. So that's what I've been working on. Right, transportation, car, buses, planes, on portable energies, right? You can use um, fuel cells to run computers, cell phones, and there you are, right? And or power needed to all of those things. So as you see, you have cars that are being uh, manufactured. California is um, one that is ahead on that. They have gas stations on the streets. So now the challenges, right? 50 years ago, the fuel cell would work and it would give one kilowatt as a power, right? And we're going to talk about the reactions, but the catalyst load was 35 milligrams of platinum per centimeter square, right? And this is what we would have. Right, have 37 milliamps. This is current density at this voltage. Now, look what we have: 0.3, 200, and 0.8. Right? So that's a good thing, right? Because you see, for about the same voltage, we increase the current, and this is a huge plus. Right? As you know, platinum is expensive, and I must say that depending on which country I am, I need to change the speech of my. Uh, change the motivation of my speech, right? Because I was in South Africa, and platinum is abundant in South Africa. So they want to explore that, because make the economy running. So if I come to this speech, you know what? Let's not use platinum. Then even though they need electricity, I will not have a job, right? So I need to change the speech. But for us in here, if you make this number smaller, the better, right? So for transportation applications, so this is where we are, and we, we were, and our goal now is to double that, right? And here, well, what makes the fuel cell costly is the catalyst, right? So that's our goal now. We want to make this possible, right? 25 to $35 per kilowatt. This is more or less where we are, right? If you put the fuel cell, these are components of the fuel cell, right? So if you put them all together, that's how the cost is. And we want to make this as low as possible, right? So in 2015, the idea is we have to, uh, the fuel cell to cost $30 per kilowatt, right? We didn't reach that, right? Because I've read a document that it says that this goal now is 2020, right? So we are not there yet. Okay, so this is from the Department of Energy. So if you have here, well, if you're talking about business now, right? This is how much has been produced in megawatts. You see in 2015, I have this big jump. This is um, stationary, right, in transportation. So from 2014 to 15, you have this big jump in here on people commercializing uh, a fuel cells for transportation, right? And as I was saying, the goal for 2020 is to have $30 for kilowatt. Okay, we're going to talk about this already. Okay, for the research itself, so I took a fuel cell, a fuel cell only, right? And the idea is now we have heat and mass transfer, we have electrochemical reactions, and let's put them all together. Let's model. Let's see if we can portray what happens in a fuel cell from first principles. Right, and the idea is now we have a mathematical model. Of course, we're going to try to validate that, and then you can um, optimize it. I'm going to talk about this a little later. Okay, so we have different types of fuel cell, right? So these two are the ones we're going to discuss today, and you see they have different temperatures, right? And according to the temperature and the kind of electrolyte. So we have different reactions. The ones that you usually use for core generation of electricity and heat are the high temperature fuel cell, these ones. Right? The one that is seeing if you can put one of those on campus is solid oxygen fuel cell. Okay, so this is schematic of a fuel cell, right? So we have here in fuel coming in, so we have a reaction, so we have an electrode, and the electrode is composed by two different layers what we call diffusion layer, where nothing happens in there other than diffusion, right? 
and you have the catalyst layer where actually the chemical reaction happens, right? So then the electrons are breaking down here, the hydrogen uh, once was um, H2, now is an ion. The electrons flow through external circuit, and the other side, the same thing happens. So we have the electrode split into different layers. We have the reaction layer, and you have the diffusion layer where only the gas is diffuses, right? So what we have in between is a membrane, right? Depending on which kind of fuel cell, this membrane also changes. And the idea here is to flow only ions, right? So the electricity flows outside of the circuit. For polymer electrolyzed membrane fuel cells, that's what we have. We have them all together in here. It's very thin and expensive. Right? So this is how we make, oh sorry, this is how this is the output, right? Every time you run a fuel cell, this is what you would have. So we're going to measure the current that the fuel cell generates with the voltage. We're going to measure them. And that's the behavior. That's the line that you want. That's what happens. So what we want is this curve here to be as high as possible, right? We don't want that to go there. So that's what happens. So how we compare two fuel cells, right? Which one has a higher curve? But these are due to losses, right? And for applications, we care about this curve here, which is our power curve, right? Because we want the maximum power, right? Which has to do as well with the design. If your application is for higher current or lower current, then you're not necessarily have the higher power. Well, it's up to your application, right? But usually what we want is high power, right? So this is the, what we call polarization curve, this blue one here, and this is only the power curve. So each region of this polarization curve has a different kind of losses, right? What we call heat activation losses are the losses that we need to overcome the inertia of the reaction, right? That's what happens here in a low current, right? Ohmic losses is just because the fuel cell heats up, right? And the heat damages um, the outcome of our reaction. And here mass transport losses is because you see you are here at high current now and you don't have enough fuel. Right, so then we have problems with diffusion now, right? Okay, so then we divided the fuel cell. This is a fuel cell, right? So we divide the fuel cell in different, um, what I call control volumes, right? We call the bipolar plates. Well, they're metal because they have to be conductive, right? Diffusion layer, reactant layer, reaction layer, they are the electrode all together. Right, in between you have, in this case, polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell, we have um, polymeric membrane here. And the same thing on the other side. So if you count them, so we have seven control volumes, right, and two bipolar plates. So what happens in the, at them? So this is what happens. So we have a reaction here, right, as we were saying. Here the, well, here they don't have a reaction, the, even though these two, two and three are the electrodes, so you hold them all together, right? They are part on the, uh, of one material. In this part, which is the thicker part, you have on diffusion, now the reaction, ions only flu uh, flowing, and the other side reaction again, and then uh, the product flowing. So we work in dimensionless world, right, to make things uh, more general, so mass flow, temperature, heat transfer coefficient, areas, the voltage, um, electrical resistance, all those variables that become, these are very important, the length. And this is, so we split the fuel cell in seven control volumes and we group them now into categories. The one that we have reaction, hap oh, we have reaction happening and the one that we don't, right? So we count for heat interactions here, right? So this is uh, in, uh, with the ambient, Right? This is the heat transfer that happens to the next control volume, right? And this is the ohmic heat. Just because you have electricity flowing, you have heat being generated. So that's why you count for these kind of control volumes. In this one, volume three, where we do have a reaction, we have work. That's how you account for the electrical, um, for the reaction in there. And here, all the heat interactions. Now, this phase interact thermically, thermally, with a control volume two, and this one with um, a control volume four, right? 
Okay, so this is diffusion layer, the electrode, and the membrane, right? So we count, we are counting here for heat um, uh, thermal conductivity, right? We are considering the, the thickness of each one, and we are counting this, right? So this is how we, we took that into account. And then we apply energy balance for each one of those, and that's what we have, right? All those are thermal um, heat interactions, and then control volume three and five are the control volumes when we have uh, the reaction happen, happening, and then we have work, free Gibbs energy, and here is only flow and diffusion, right? Why are we, why are we uh, doing this job? Because, see, we took in consideration the length, right? When it doesn't show here, but when we make these numbers all dimensionalized, we are considering the length. We are considering the thermal conductivity. Now you consider the material itself, right? So when you talk about uh, the Gibbs free energy and the reaction, you're talking about the temperature and pressure of the reactants, right? And once we have all of those, oh, and there's another thing that's very important here. We are considering the temperature distribution in here, right? So each control volume of those have a, its own temperature, right? So this is one of our findings, though. We want to see if you talk about fuel cell out there, they want to say, well, this fuel cell works at 80 degrees Celsius. That's operational temperature. But is that important to know that actually it, the temperature in the fuel cell is not uniform? Right? That's a question I'm trying to answer. So there's an approximation. So the temperature is uniform, but, but, but for, effect, um, for modeling, can you assume that and have safe um, conclusions? So now once we have all the temperatures solved, because that's what we get from solving this system of equations, right? So now let's think about the electrical part, right? So the voltage, that's what we call a reversible voltage here. So you consider all the losses, activation losses, diffusion losses, anomic losses, right? And once we compute them all, we can finally calculate the power of the fuel cell for that specific current. And there's another thing about this uh, model, right? The current is an independent variable, right? So we set the current. So if the current is one, what will be the voltage for that, right? Because you can see here that the isomic heat depends on the current, right? So this is just uh, how we compute the losses, right? And once again, the current is here. And this is the way that uh, we chose to, to, to make uh, yeah, experiments. So the w that's the way that we chose right, to make this modeling. There are a lot of models out there where actually the current is not independent variable. Right? That's just um, the way that we chose to do it. So we have the model ready. Right? So, so let's make experiment and see how, how far we are from the reality. Right? So we have this rig in here. So we have different fuel cells. right? And then we imagine that's easy, right? We have only the fuel cell. We have hydrogen tank, air, right? In millimeters. You're measuring the current and the voltage. And this is our results, right? The experimental results. The temperature, the pressures, and that's our curve, right? This is what we got. So now let's see um, how far we are from from the reality. You see, we have to measure porosity, right? Why is that? It has to do with area. In this here, I failed to mention that this is porosity, right? So the gases must diffuse, and they're going to diffuse by, uh, through the pores of the material, right? So we measure the porosity, the density. We measure specific heat and everything. So, but there are parameters that he didn't know, right? Then we didn't have means to calculate that. So we just use inverse parameters, uh, inverse problem of parameter estimation. And here is uh, the thickness of each control volume. And you see how thick the electrode is, 0.5 millimeters. Right, so the electrode is 0.5 millimeters. So these are numerical results, right? Our polarization curve. And that's how we compare them, right? So the numeric is right here, the experimental here. And then, as I was talking, you see, it works well in here. And then it says, so what about this part here, right? So if you see, that's where you are. We have high current for the high power, right? 
So I understand there needs to be some sort of adjustment done here, but that's not the part that you are interested in, right? Not yet. So that's for a uh, polymeric fuel cell. So now for the alkaline fuel cell, there is a difference in here. So for the PAM fuel cells, we have a, we call acid fuel cell, right? But in this case, we have an alkaline solution which will make, uh, will be part of the membrane, right? So both of fuel cells, they are a low temperature, so they reach more or less about the same application. But the polymeric one needs platinum. And if we explore the concept about the alkaline one, we can use other metals, nickel, for example, gold, right? And let's see if we can actually make that happen. Make that happen. If we can reach with those metals and make these fuel cells so efficient as the previous one, right? We did exactly the same approach. So we split the fuel cell. Oh, here's the thing, right? The difference in the reaction, right? And exactly the same approach. So the alkaline fuel cells, they are nothing, they are not new, right? So they exist, they went to the moon, right? They went to the moon, they were there, right? But uh, I can have the liquid electrolyte flowing here, um, alkaline solution or KOH flowing here, right? Remember that if your cell generates heat, right? So I have something flowing here, it's good because it removes the heat, right? However, remember the idea of the fuel cell is generate power, right? If this is flowing here, I need somehow to pump this liquid here. So part of the energy that the fuel cell generates, I need to spend making this to flow. And another thing is, is a liquid flowing, you need to think about how this fuel cell is going to be placed on your application, right? So if you are, you know, if you are jet skiing, for example, right, you're having maneuvers all the time. So can a fuel cell, this kind of fuel cell, stand all the instability of a jet ski, right? So I have another one now where the electrolyte, uh, what we call is static, right? So you still have liquid, uh, alkaline solution in here, but now instead of flowing, they are in a porous of a, of a material, right? But it still is liquid, it's like a sponge or something very porous that you uh, soak that material in alkaline solution. And you have another one where we have like solid, right? You have a, poly a polymer where the polymer allows OH minus to flow, right? Our experiment for this part was done using this kind of alkaline uh, membrane here, right? Use chromatography paper, right? And you soak the chromatography paper in alkaline solution, and then you put them together in a fuel cell. The idea was to prove the concept, right? And I'm gonna show you the outcome just now. So um, if you think about the electrolyte of the fuel cell, right? They must have high ionic conductivity because that's what they're designed for, right? Low electronic conductivity, the one the electrons are flowing here, high stability, right? Lower fuel crossover, we don't want the fuel to go through without reacting at electrodes, right? Mechanical strength, easy manufacturability. As we're saying, right, depending on you have orientation of the fuel cells. Mm, get ready to talk about this. So we've done the same approach, the same analysis, and this is our prototype then. So you have a chromatography paper, very thick, but for the uh, purpose of proving the concept was good enough. So this is our fuel cell here. So the, bi uh, the uh, bipolar plates, we made of brass. So we have these channels here, right? So this is where the gas are flowing in and out of this version. This is the electrode, right? This is um, a picture image of, of the fusion layer. Right? And the other side, you have the reactive layer, and this is the cross-section. And we can see that where the reaction happens is thicker or thinner than where the diffusion is, right? So this is the fuel cell. You see it's very, um, so we can see all the layers in here. The white part is the, is the membrane with the alkaline solution, and the black part is the electrode. And it was very interesting because uh, if we go a little bit yeah. high, if we don't control the mass flow enough in here, we would have flames, 
right? You have sparks here because think about it. You are, you know, we have licking here, right? And they are very close together, right? It was very my <laughs> my boss would say, if you want to explode these, explode the entire building, right? Because then the insurance covers everything. But if you explode only the lab, then I need to give explanations, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yes, though nothing serious happened. So okay, so then this is the rig, uh, the film hood that we work. They're the same thing, the, the tanks and the fuel cell and the multimeters. Okay, so those are our results now. So we change the resistance, so we have like a, a electrical um, um, a load, that's how we call, and we change and, and we measure, measure it. So that's where we that's what we have, right? So once again, so we are off in some parts, right? So, but now, we put them together now, so I have our work and our, our power. And I must admit, you see how, how low the maximum power is? 0.2, right? So this fuel cell was used only to prove the concept, right? You're not going to use this fuel cell for anything else, right? Right, because um, we have a lot of reaction happen that we didn't want. Right? Remember the bipolar plate? They, they are made of brass, right? And you, we study, you study chemistry, so we have KOH with brass, and all of a sudden we have blue dots on our brass plate, right? And you're not expecting to have anything in there, right? So that could be one of the explanations why our power is so low, because there was something else happening there that we didn't want, right? Okay, so there's another thing though. We are working in these experiments with concent different concentrations, right? Because the uh, polymeric one, we don't control, uh, well, we have acidity, we have to care about uh, flooding because we have a lot of water being generated and if there's a lot of water generated, the fuel cell doesn't work well either, right? And now we have an alkaline solution and you can control that and see which, which concentration gives us the best um, power, the higher power. So I've done that with the same figure, 45. And then we can show you the comparison between them both, right? So this is the polarization curve, right? And then you can see that with 30%, we did have higher power, right? Okay, so then now, okay, that's great. So now, if you tell me what kind of fuel cell you have, what are the physical properties of the fuel cell, I can tell you what is the output of your fuel cell, right? Because that's what the model is for. Because then you can think about, so okay, uh, this fuel cell is, I want to improve this fuel cell and I want to ma make it more efficient. I want to have more power from the fuel cell. What should I do? So if we talk to experimentalists, okay, let's make a new electrode and then let's try have this porosity or have try with this thermal conductivity or electrical conductivity, right? But I can tell you what happened. So if you change those, and we could work together then, so I can tell you, you know what? This is the best fuel cell that you can have. So now it's your job to make it, right? So synthesize, make with an uh, electrode that have these properties, right? So well, so now we're talking about optimization then. So how we optimize this then? So I have some restrictions, right? Because how big can a fuel cell be? Right, so the fuel cell, this fuel cell that I just showed you, is this big, right? So I'm going to be walking around with this fuel cell this big every place you go with your laptop, right? You, no, maybe you, right? So we have volume uh, constraints, right? So once you have that, that's what we call total volume. So that's why we usually uh, we work with non-dimensional numbers, right? So you divide every single length in here by this parameter total volume by one third, so we have this guy here, right? So the volume is a constraint, right? So we now have a mathematical model of how the power goes, right? So the net power of the fuel cell is the power that the fuel cell generates minus the power that is needed to make the gases to flow through it. And that's what it is, right? So we know everything now to make or optimization. So let's change parameters and see how these parameters affect the output of the fuel cell. So the net power is function of internal structure, 
right, and external shape. So what is the difference here now, internal structure, external shape? Internal structure is how I vary the thickness of these control volumes here, right? External shape is the shape of these blocks here. If it's square, if it's a little bit shorter than higher, and so on, right? So if I dimension, uh, work with non-dimensional numbers, so these are length, so it has to be one. This is these control volumes, and these two guys here count for the thickness of, of the bipolar plates, right? And then I have all the parameters that you have these. So you see, those are all numbers that the lab can give us, right? And external shape, x, y, yeah, x, y, and z, the length, height, and depth. And that's what we have. So it might sound scary, but so those are all length of the fuel cell. So those guys here, all the thickness of each one of the compartments, right? For that parameters, th for this, for this, uh, for these properties here, right? So this is what you have, right? And then you have the current. So you see that as we expected, we have a maximum power, right? And you see our restriction here, 80. But now see, let's define these now. Control volume two plus control volume three is the electrode. This, two plus three is the electrode. Right, the same thing in this side, and this is the membrane. So how thick the reaction layer can be and you still have a good performance. When I say performance, power, right? So that's why we did here, right? So this is three and five, three and five. So if I change this value, this value also changes, right? Because this one is constant, right? What is, what is the number here? Everything here is 0.8. Oh, it says here in the top, right? 0.2 is 0.25, right? So I change it, this value and see how this one here behaves. And that's what I have here. You see now I have optimal, right? Because I can have 20 as external shape, Y and Z, 20. And I can change the thickness of the electrode and see how it behaves, right? Meaning, for a specific size, external size of the fuel cell, how do I play with the thickness of the electrode so I can have the maximum power? That's actually the question that this, that this graph is telling you. For a specific shape or external shape of the fuel cell, how can I play with the thickness of the electrode to have a maximum power, right? So then, there what we have. This is the high power for this external shape. So how much can I increase my fuel cells, the external shape of the fuel cell, and you still have an increase in power, right? It's not much clear here, but we went up to 150, and 200 started decreasing, right? So we also got to a point where the size of fuel cell ended up not helping with the output that we want, okay? Okay, so our conclusions then. So we have, we first model the fuel cell. We consider the temperature across the fuel cell, right? And then we said that if that's what it means. The temperature is a function of space and current. Meaning, what means space is where in the fuel cell. We have seven control volumes. Wherever you put your finger, you know what the temperature is in there. If it's an electrode, if it's in a membrane, and a bipolar plate, you know what that temperature is. And you know that that temperature is a function of current, okay? So we see that for, for a higher power, our experimental results uh, match, right? Um, we also saw that for alkaline membrane if you cell, the inf we could see the influence on concentration. And there's a the thing. When we change the concentration for, from 30% to 45%, right? Everything that is function of concentration had to change. Makes sense, right? And still, we need to have um, consistent results, right? And that's what we prove as well. So our model also is strong enough or robust enough to contemplate that change, right? 
uh, we consider pressure drop as well. I didn't talk about this, but we need to consider that as well because of the, uh, the power that you need to span to use to make the gas to flow, right? And then you can use these optimization purposes, right? So the main idea of my talk today is if you m have your model right, when I say right, uh, consistent and accurate, right? You can use these as optimization tool, right? And you can use these as a challenge or a tool to solve the scientific challenge that you have, right? And because, you see, we got to that point that for the maximum power, the thickness of the electrode is x, whatever that thickness is. But now, how can we make, and now that's why I need your help, right? How can we make a electrode that thin with that properties that I'm telling you that they need to be done, right? And now we know, right, that that thickness is the one. We don't need to run experiments, and remember the experiments require time, which is fine, right? But it requires also money, right? which is not that fine. Remember that, uh, well, talking about money not being fine, every time I burn my fuel cell, every time I have an explosion, I would be burning $200, right? Because one electrode this big costs $100, mm -hmm. right? So there are situations where experiment is expensive and we need to have a direction where, I, where we go, right? I thank you all for your attention and I think that was all. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 No. No. Uh, my research group. I was not involved with that but they tried to run the same thing with another solution, but I myself was not involved, right? Because the idea of this was exactly to prove a concept, right? That we could do that and then, now if we want to come up with another solution we can use, I can put in that and see what, what comes with this. But I haven't worked with that. But do you not all have your experiments? You're saying the output, if it's more efficient or not? Uh, no, I don't. No. Sorry, I didn't work with that, so I don't know. Yes. This one, where they have this one? The first one. If you see it, Okay, I think that was the first one. Is everyone? Um, okay, I think that's this one? No. Because in here, what I show you, we have the diffusion layer here and reaction layer here. Oh, the parts. Oh, okay. So then that that work. Oh, sorry. Here, I think this would do well. Let's go back to the first one. Here. So that in here I have the fuel cell split in seven counter volumes, and here's the top view of the counter volumes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This one. Yes. What, what are, we are doing what? I assume that we are, uh, we are definitely around here. Let's well, say between here and the 30. Right. I would assume that doing that, I would assume that I can do that. 
Uh huh. Yes. 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 Yeah. Well, the fuel cells, they only one fuel cell is worth nothing. So I need more than one, right? Because the power of the one fuel cell is very low. The highest voltage I have one fuel cell is 1.2 volts, right? So you need to stack them together. So to answer your questions, you can have as many fuel cells all together to do whatever you want, right? But as you're saying, it becomes heavy. Right? So it becomes heavy. So once again, it's a problem of optimization. Right? And another thing is, it has to be, what is the fuel? It's hydrogen. So hydrogen is a gas, so you need a tank, which is a metal. Right? So the thing is, so you need to make this trade-off. Right? So you're carrying a metal, and you have a heavy things. So the answer for your question is yes. Right? But it still is a challenge how we do that in a very efficient way. Right? Um, Another thing, though, you can use fuel cells for planes, right? However, the fuel cell generates enough power to sustain a flight, but it doesn't generate power quick enough for a takeoff or landing. So there is a challenge now is the response of the fuel cell. Once you press the gas pedal, how long does it take to actually get the velocity that you want, right? So the response in that the transient, that's how we call this a steady state, but the transient response of the fuel cell is also something that people are studying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dylan, I think things are turned finally. Yes, yes. I'm glad to ask that because I didn't talk about this, right? But for the polymeric one, humidity is very important. You cannot, dry air or dry fuel is not good. So you have to have some sort of humidification, right? And it's too much is also not good, right? So in lab, you need to humidify the gases that I have before in the fuel cell, right? So yes, the humidity plays a role in there because for the polymeric fuel cell affects the ionic conductivity. The ionic conductivity of a polymeric fuel cell is function of humidity, right? Now for the alkaline fuel cell, that's all right, but remember if you have too much water, what happens to the concentration of the, of the, the solution, right? So you need to uh, control that. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's more, I mean, uh, Walmart uses, you know, I mean, uh, yes, there are, there is room for the applications, so, I mean, right? Oh, you know, I must tell you something, right? So the thing is, there are applications, right, that you do depend on fossil fuel still, right? Military applications, they are not going to fuel cell. They are not. They need, once again, that quick response of power, right? So my point is, the answer for your question, the answer is yes. But now what I do not know is actually people are really willing to find that out, right? Because we have an economic problem now. Let's say that everybody, well, what I say is I don't have a job in Texas, right? Because oil is there. So, you know, there is this kind of economical um, balance sometimes, right? But I do believe there is room for fuel cell be widely spread, right? I think, not I think, well, uh, 
we don't know how long it took for the cell phones to be, you know, what they are now. How long people have been researching about cell phones, right, for them to be what they are now. So at some point, you're going to reach the same thing. Let's say the fuel cell now you can buy everywhere in a very cheap price. But how many decades before people are already studying it, right? Yes. Yes. Uh Well, well, there. Well, if you think about hydrogen exploding, yes, right. But if you think about the li hydrogen leaking, right, because it's a gas and it's light in the air, it goes up quickly, right. If you have a car accident, you don't have hydrogen sitting around you like you'd have gasoline around you, right. So uh, hydrogen is non-toxic, toxic, but well, safety lab safety now, right. So we need to have sensors, right, because. We don't smell hydrogen, and we don't feel oh, we're gonna pass out. We just die, right? <laughs> because hydrogen, you don't die because you're breathing hydrogen. You die because you're not breathing air, oxygen, right? So you need to have a safety uh, a device in there that beeps when the concentration is too high, right? But about having hydrogen around, that's not an issue, exactly because of this. Because it's lighter than air, so it's gas. So, but yes, you need to be careful. You need to have regulations have to be done. And there's another thing though, now not for the scientists like us, but lawyers need to think about regulations now, right? So yes, it is a very big um, field to research. Yes, yeah. But here's another thing that, uh, well, you don't have combustion in fuel cells. I know, right? right? You can reuse the water that you generate and break it down, and then you have again. So, yes, you can have a closer look. Well, then you need to make a set of losses, right? Because if you are how much energy you're producing and how much energy you need to break and then how big is your loop if you need fresh water. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, the, the concept is great because you can use that water that you generate and break it down again and have it again, right? But then you need to be careful you not have perpetual machine concept involved in that, mm -hmm. right? Which is okay. not possible. Yes. The solid alkaline fuel cells, they are like the polymeric ones. So the membrane is a polymer, okay. right? So heat-wise, uh, they are about the same thing, right? So the way that you dissipate heat in those fuel cells is the same that you did in a polymeric one, right? So it's just a plus when you have the, uh, the solution flowing. And I would say that nobody used that anymore, right? So, yeah. That wasn't like the first concept, but um, nobody used that. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, we want to thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you. Thank you.